All right, City West, how you guys doing? Yeah. Would you help me just thank the band one more time? Today we are going to be talking about sex, and uh, you know, I think people get an idea in their mind that they're going to come to church, and it's going to be a sex talk, and it's going to be a long list of do's and don'ts, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's just that for too long, uh, churches have honed in on trying desperately to change behaviors, behavioral modification. And if we look at the history, uh, as history has moved along, and we looked at what is happening in our culture, unfortunately, it doesn't look like all of the do's and don'ts list are working that well as we continue to live in an increasingly sexualized culture. And so my goal for today is not necessarily to talk on an individual level or talk about the do's and the don'ts. Today, we're gonna take some time and make the case for biblical sexuality. I think there are a lot of really sincere believers, people who are children of God, who are desperate to be a part of Jesus' movement here on the earth. They want their lives to matter. And what you may not realize is that your sexual worldview and your sexual actions are not actually being based off of the foundation of God's word. They're being based off of the current of culture and what everyone else is doing. And so I wanna try to make a case today. To be honest, this is a difficult talk for me. Um, I, I, not, you know, I spend a lot of time preparing it and stuff. It's a little out of my wheelhouse. It's not, I'm comfortable just more preaching scripture and sweating and yelling and stuff like that. Today is gonna be a little bit more <clears throat> teaching and walking through things. There's gonna be a couple spots that get a little bit complex, but we'll stop and we'll make sure that everyone's on the same page before we move on. Uh, we're gonna be talking about difficult topics today. We're gonna be addressing uh, the sexual misconduct and, and the systemic oppression of women that we're seeing in our society. And, uh, and just a reminder, at the end of the day, here at City West, we do not create truth. We discover it in God's word and we stand on it proudly as our foundation. So you guys good? That was the introduction. Can we get going now? Yeah. All right. Uh, the way that we're gonna, we're gonna make this case today is we're going to be looking at a historical perspective uh, of gender roles, gender relations, sexual, uh, sexual attitudes in culture. Um, so I wanna start with present day. I wanna paint the reality uh, of where we are in 2018. Uh, today we have what is being called a hookup culture. Uh, sex has become incredibly casual, and it's not just in the adult world, it's not just in the clubs and in the bars, uh, it's in our universities, it's in our high schools. Uh, in many areas of the country, it's made its way all the way down to our middle schools, where now middle school-aged children are engaging in casual sex, and, uh, and it keeps getting younger and younger. The average age of exposure to hardcore pornography is eight years old. Your eight-year-olds are now no longer safe from the, the incredible dangers of Hardcore pornography. Uh, there are apps that live in our phones, that live in our pockets, countless apps uh, that allow people to hook up and have sexual encounters with a swipe of a finger. And what you may not know is that there is a, a new genre of apps that are basically direct clones of adult hookup apps, uh, but that are marketed for 12 to 17 year olds. And so uh, the, the, the world is doing some interesting things in the area of sexuality. We know that advertisers don't think twice about flaunting provocative ads. Some of you had to drive down South 1604 to get here and you passed a 40 foot woman in her underwear. I'm sure no, no one noticed that. <laughs> sexual encounters are on the rise uh, and yet sexual satisfaction is plummeting. And, uh, and although you may be a believer and have this godly desire, if we're not on guard and we're not intentional about looking at the core uh, of our own worldview and our own beliefs, then we can get swept along with what the rest of culture around us is doing. So what is it that shapes uh, our cultural sexual identity? What, what is responsible for all of the different sexual revolutions that we see throughout the different decades and the different generations? If you grew up in church, like I did, I grew up in, in Southern Baptist churches, 
We always blamed all of it on Hollywood. It was such an easy target. And Hollywood didn't really mean the city. It just meant generally the celebrities and the major influencers in the world. And we pointed our finger. I grew up in the churches that boycotted everything. We would boycott anything that didn't line up exactly with what we believed. I'll never forget as a kid when our church decided to boycott Disney. And I was like, I may be out on this whole Christianity thing. I'm not really sure. <laughs> And the sad reality is that once again, we were, we were attacking just behaviors. We were trying to, to talk people in or bully them into different actions. And unfortunately, when those things don't work, a lot of times the church just begins to look inward. They take an isolationist stance on the world. They go, man, heaven is coming for us someday. And until then, we'll just bunker down and we'll hide out in our sanctuaries and we'll sign up for six different Bible studies and we'll spend every night of the week at the church. And meanwhile, the people who were already in my sphere of life, who were desperate for the hope of Jesus that is inside side of me are left high and dry because I have disappeared into my community of faith. And that is why we talk all the time about being a movement that does meet together, but the reason we meet together is so we can go out and move together powerfully and actually have a voice in the culture. That's not what we're talking about today, but I think it's important. So pointing the finger at Hollywood, these celebrities are poisoning our children's minds, they're ruining our families, they're downgrading our marriages, uh, and at the same time, you know you're gonna go see Black Panther this weekend, so you're kind of caught in a, in, a, in a conundrum there. I wanna go down further, and I wanna look at what really creates culture, because if we know what creates it, then we have an opportunity to potentially change it. We're gonna be looking today at the cultural core and to some of you this may be a little boring and it is a little bit complex but just stay with me because it is important and where we land today it's going to be important to understand this if you think of the cultural core uh like like you could think of it like an onion right where it has different layers and you can continually peel back these layers at the outermost layer of our culture is actions. When you see people taking consistent actions, the majority of people acting in the same way. And actions are difficult because it's what we can see. It's tangible, it's what we experience. And so a lot of people mistake actions for culture. They see a majority of people doing the same things and they think that's all that culture is. But that would be like us looking at our front yards and thinking that that's all there is to the earth. When anyone who's made it to third grade science knows that there is layers and layers of soils and dirts and rock all the way to bedrock to the core. There's more to it than just our actions. If you peel back the first layer of our actions, then you find worldview. And worldview is unique to people as individuals based on where they're from and the family they grew up in and the experiences they've had and the traumatic events in their life. All of that shapes our worldview. But there is truth that culture tends to be created on the coasts in the metropolitan areas, the Hollywoods, the Seattles, New York, Washington DC, Miami, and permeates across the country and sets the trends that set the culture. And so what happens is over time, many people and eventually a majority of people start viewing things the same way and we come up with a cultural worldview. When a majority of people take a certain view on sex and sexuality, that becomes the cultural sexual worldview. And our worldview is what leads to our actions. A lot of times we think actions just happen. We just experience something and then we act but that's not how humans work we have more than just instinct it starts with the worldview that leads to our actions now the first two layers of our cultural core we can summarize and make it a little simpler and call these our behaviors these are our behaviors and a lot of people get to worldview and they think that's what culture is but it's not there are more layers because beneath our behavior is our beliefs and so underneath our worldview specific to the conversation of sex is anthropology. Not the store where you can buy a $90 t-shirt at La Cantera. <laughs> anthropology is what we believe about humans, what we believe about man and woman. And our anthropology, what we believe about us, will inform our worldview that informs our actions. If you believe that humans have a soul and a spirit and are eternal beings, then it will influence your worldview and your actions in a completely different way if you think that humans do not have a soul or a spirit or that we're just a slightly higher evolved animal. And then at the core 
of our cultural core. The core of the core is our theology, what we believe about God. And what I want to suggest today is that what we believe about God, if you look through the history of the world, is the ultimate determiner of what your culture looks and acts like. A lot of people would disagree with that, but whether you're here and maybe you're a skeptic or you're agnostic or atheist, or if you're watching online and you're tempted to tune out at this point because it's just gonna be another preacher talking about the Bible and talking about God, we're going to take uh, an unbiased look at history. We're going to be looking at facts. Even when we look at scripture today, we're not gonna be looking at it as this highly spiritualized word of God. We're gonna be looking at it in its historical context because the key to culture is what you and I believe about God. I wanna talk today about the Me Too movement. I wanna talk about the Time's Up movement. Is anyone familiar with these movements that are going on? Basically, over the last few years, there have been some shocking revelations. Some of our like childhood heroes, uh, some big-time influencers throughout our world who have been uh, accused of incredible sexual misconduct. And, and there were some brave people who got on social media platforms and they started a movement called Me Too. And the point of Me Too was to give a voice to victims of sexual harassment, sexual abuse, sexual misconduct. And it went viral. And all of these victims finally had the courage to stand up for themselves and to speak out. And, and then they started naming names and things begin to unravel right before our eyes. And what was brought to the conscience of the nation is that there is a systemic injustice of sexual abuse that is in every sphere of life, not just in Hollywood, not just with actors and comedians, not just in politics, not just in the business world, not just in the church world, everywhere. It's in our neighborhoods, it's in our schools, it is hitting close to home, that women are living under oppression. In the last few weeks, I have talked to two young women who are being sexually preyed upon by married men who are in positions of influence over them, and they don't feel like they can stand up and speak out. It's incredibly important. These movements, Me Too and Time's Up, uh, these movements start when there is a contradiction in our cultural core. When, when two or more things in the cultural core get off balance from each other, it causes friction which sparks these movements and if the movements are corrective to the culture, they turn into revolutions and we see real change and real reform. We are seeing some of the most devastating things being done to people uh, by, by mostly men in positions of power. We are seeing celebrities who have everything they could already want, who are trapping women, exposing themselves, masturbating in front of them. We have Hollywood producers and directors who your career trajectory as an actress is going to be dependent on what sexual favors you will do for them. And women who have stood up for themselves in those situations have been blacklisted and aspiring, talented young act actresses never saw the light of another movie studio. What we're seeing is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking for the victims. And the crazy thing is, uh, and the unfortunate thing is, these movements haven't been around very long, but it seems like they're already losing steam. And there's several reasons for this. One of it is just that uh, their media life cycle is coming to an end. Uh, the unfortunate reality is that when things uh, stop spiking ratings, they get talked about less and less. Another reason is there have been people who have abused these movements. They've used them as an opportunity to, to lay allegations on men who are innocent and their names have been dragged through the mud and, and that kind of uh, lowered the power of the movement in many people's minds. But I, I wanna suggest that these movements are, 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 are petering out because they are not getting down to the cultural core. Most of it is talking about actions, which we now know is the outermost layer. And we need to be discussing the actions and people need to be called on what they've done. However, if we just focus on the actions, it's gonna be like trying to cure cancer with Band-Aids. We have to go deeper to discover the problem 
systemically in our culture. Some people in the movement have done that. They've peeled back a layer and they've talked about worldview and they've called for a change of worldview and they think that will change the culture, but they're still just messing with behaviors to really make change. These movements will have to go deeper than behaviors. They will have to address our beliefs as a society. And so today, what I want us to do is I want us to take a brief trip through history, and, and I want to see how this idea of cultural core, how this idea of theology, what we believe about God, has shaped culture since the beginning of time. Now, obviously, we don't have time right now to go all the way through the history of the world. I wish we did. My, Mike, my producer, told me we do not. So we're going we're gonna to cut it a little bit short, but... We do have some incredible moments that dramatically shifted things in history that we can focus on. One of those uh, is when our calendars got split into two sections. Right now we live in AD 2018. We've had 2018 years of living under the AD calendar. Before that, we were in BC in the history of the world. There's a lot of debate over how long BC was because not all of it is in recorded history. Some people think 6,000 years. Some people think 6 million years. We're not here to have that debate today. What we can say is it was longer than what we have experienced in AD, these 2018 years. And one thing that we can do is we can group all of BC together to talk about gender roles. Because in BC, whether it was 6,000 years or 6 million years, there is no evidence that women were ever, ever seen as equal. In the entirety of history, women were never seen as equal. In most places in the world, women were treated as property. They had very little value. Their role in life was to get pregnant and to give their husbands a son. And if they could not give them a son, then they were shamed. Now, this was scalable. Some places in the world, women were treated better than others, but nowhere close to what we call gender equality. And so what happened? Well, things began to change for the first, this is so critical, for the first time in history, things began to shift for women around 30 AD when a man named Jesus, a Jewish man, began to travel and teach and blow people's minds in the Middle East. He started a movement and after his time on earth was finished, he handed this movement to a group of people called the apostles. They pushed this movement forward. It immediately faced unbelievable persecution. And in the face of that centuries and centuries of persecution, it not only survived, but it thrived. It went all the way around the world. And what was it that propelled this movement, that protected it against the persecution, that helped it to spread to so many people? It was love. At the very foundation of Jesus' movement is his call to radically, authentically, and without any conditions, love the people around you. Later, the apostles who helped spread this movement, they would go, they would start congregations of believers who would gather together, and often they would write them letters. We have a lot of these letters in the New Testament of our Bible. They are the, the books of the New Testament. One of these letters was from the apostle Paul, and he was writing to a group of believers in a town called Ephesus, and we have this in our Bibles as the book of Ephesians. And in Ephesians 5, Paul starts talking about the relationship that this call to love has between men and women. And this is the starting place for us really understanding how we can take a part in correcting the injustice in our culture. And in Ephesians 5.22, Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. I love this verse because a lot of men start taking notes for the first time ever and it's, what was that, 5.22? Got, I got that one. Wives, submit. Everyone say submit. 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 Men, if you have like a really, really comfortable couch, look at your wife and say submit. No, I'm just kidding, don't do that. That's a bad idea. <laughs> Wives, submit to your husbands. Let's be honest, we don't love this verse. We don't love this verse, and there's reasons. If you grew up in the church world, you know that verses like this have been taken out of context, and they have been used to make women second-class citizens and, and to keep wives in the kitchen, pregnant and barefoot, making their man a sandwich for hundreds of years. We don't like it. We don't like the idea of submission. We don't like 
uh, that, uh, that the wives just get called out right off the bat. Here's something that's interesting, though. In 2018, we don't really like it. We're uncomfortable with it. In Ephesus, in the first century, the people this letter was actually written to, they would have just been like, yeah, that's, that's how it goes. Wives, submit to your husbands. Jewish men at that time had what's called patria potestas. That means they had legal jurisdiction over their wives. They were property. They could leave them for something as simple as burning the toast. It's interesting, though, if you look in the original letter that Paul wrote. Paul didn't write in English. He wrote in ancient Greek. It's called Koine Greek. And if you look at verse 22, in the original Greek, this is what it says. Wives, to your own husband, as to the Lord. Wives, to your own husband, as to the Lord. Well, what's missing? Can I get an amen, ladies? Come Where did submit go? Where is the verb? This sentence doesn't even make sense. Wives to your husband, as to the Lord. It's interesting, in Greek grammar, what they would do is often they would give an introductory statement and the introduction would set up the theme for everything they were about to say. And that verb would be carried through the rest of the content without having to be repeated. Submit is there, but it's in verse 21 where it says, submit to one another. It's mutual submission. Paul said, submit to one another. Wives, to your own husbands as to the Lord. But husbands, he gets us. Verse 25, he says, husbands, love your wives. Now love is not in place of submission, it is in addition to. And this sounds normal to us, of course we love our wives. But back in the day, they weren't meeting on eHarmony. They weren't falling in love over candlelight dinners. You married a woman because you wanted her father's land when she died. It was a business exchange. And now Paul says, love your wives. Not only that, but love them as Christ loved the church. This was written to believers. They were believers in Jesus, which means they know how the story goes. Jesus died naked, hanging on a cross, the ultimate act of submission. Men had no obligation to their wives. And Paul chose his words carefully because Jesus had no obligation to us. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for us. And in the same way, husbands are to love their wives even as their own bodies. Equality. You know, the early movement of Jesus, uh, the, the percentages, it was a high, high percentage of women. Women flocked to the movement of Jesus because there was nowhere else in the entire world and there had never been anywhere in the history of the world where a woman could come and hear about her own inherent worth, her own inherent value, her own equality in the eyes of God. You see, Gender equality is not a natural thing. It's a supernatural thing that took a supernatural act of God coming down to this earth and living as a man named Jesus who stood up and spoke out for women. And who would know more about the value and worth of women than the person who created them? So here's what's important to understand as, as we're talking about culture. 2,000 years later, every place you see in the world where women are actually on a path to equality is a place that has been affected by the movement of Jesus. If you look at our cultural core and, uh, and we go to our next stop on our historical journey, which is the beginning of our society that we're talking about right now that has gotten so far off course with these systemic problems, our society started in 1776 when we declared our independence as a sovereign nation from Great Britain. And we were not started as a Christian nation. We are not a theocracy. We were set up as a democracy. But if you read the history of the founding of our country, it is undeniable that our culture, which is separate from our political system, our culture was uniquely Christian and uniquely based on the Bible. But we also know in history that there was a laundry list of moral injustices and systemic problems. The same Bible-believing founding fathers who wrote the words that we believe all, all 
all men are created equal, owned thousands of slaves and saw them as less than human. Women were nowhere near equality. They had to fight for decades upon decades, even just to get the basic right to vote. And so what happened was we started our country with contradictions in the cultural core. But what we know is that contradictions create friction and the friction creates the spark to the movements. And if movements move our culture into alignment, they become revolutions and real change happens. And so at the beginning of our country, we had a theology that said we believe in Jesus and his words and the word of God. And so we read the word of God and we see Jesus on earth constantly pursuing racial reconciliation. Jesus was Jewish and he purposefully made a trip through Samaria where the Samaritans and the Jews were toxically racist against each other. Jews didn't even believe that Samaritans were full human beings, much like when we finally gave Africa. Americans the right to vote and they only got three-fifths because they wouldn't concede that they were full humans something wrong with our anthropology it's not being informed by the theology but that contradiction eventually sparked these movements it sparked emancipation it sparked Rosa Parks it sparked MLK the, the, the sit-ins the bus boycotts the marches and these movements became revolutions and we saw real change and women were not seen as equal. There was a contradiction between how we were acting and what we said we believe. We believe in a Jesus who constantly stood up for women, but we treat women like second-class citizens. And that contradiction created friction, which sparked movements that turned into revolutions, and we got on paths to real change. Progress, progress was made sometimes slowly. There is still a lot of progress to be made, but we came a long way. We now have women leading in almost every aspect of society, a lot of times leading at a much higher capacity than men. In 60 years, we went from segregation to the United States electing the first black president. Real progress. So let me ask you something, and this is a real question. Does it feel like all of a sudden recently things are getting worse? And why is that? If history holds true, Something has gotten off course with our cultural core. And we said that actions are just a surface level and our worldviews are just what informs our action. It's not about our behaviors, it is about our beliefs. In the 1970s, postmodern thought was introduced into our society at a large scale. And it began to compete with Christian theology to sit at the seat of the root of our cultural core. And if you grew up in the church world, and even if you didn't, you saw many of these battles play out between postmodern thinking and biblically-based Christianity thinking. And the problem is they can't coexist at the core because postmodern thought is based on the idea that everything is relative. There is no absolute truth, which means there is no absolute morality. And Christianity is based on the unchanging truths of the word of God. So absolute truth and no truth could not coexist. They battled it out for decades, but by the early 2000s, even most church leaders in America were willing to concede that we were living in a postmodern, post-truth, post-Christian nation. It doesn't mean it was everyone, it just means that it was a majority. And so let's go back to where we started. Culture is largely created by the metropolitan coasts. Postmodern, postmodern thought started there. It's been propelled forward by the entertainment industry, by political reforms, by decisions throughout the past couple of decades. And so what if, can we just entertain the question, what if the incredible progress that was made in our country towards a uniquely Christian view of racial and gender reconciliation has now been disjointed by postmodern thought sitting in the theological seat of our cultural core. Think about it. In the history of the world, women were always seen as property. They never had equality until Jesus. That is what changed things. In the history of time, other races and ethnicities and cultures were feared and hated, misunderstood. They were conquered and enslaved until Jesus. In one of Paul's letters, he said, there is now no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. This is unique to the ancient world. No one thought like this before Jesus. This was mind-blowing to people in the first century. 
And so now we're in 2018, we see racial tensions flaring. Our eyes are open to a systemic problem of sexual abuse. And the same groups of people who have propagated and pushed forward modern thought that gets rid of all truth and gets rid of all morality now cries foul, but they do not have a foundation to stand on. They're calling for truth in a world that has abandoned truth. Once again, there's a contradiction in our cultural core, but this time, it is not our theology calling us to different actions, it is our actions calling us to a new theology. They don't realize it, but the, the leaders of the Me Too movement, and the Time's Up movement, they may not realize it, but what they are calling our society toward is a uniquely Christian theology, anthropology, worldview, and uniquely Christian actions. People are desperate for it, and they don't even know it. Every godless society on earth has men dominating women in every sphere of life. And if our culture continues to turn its back on God, if we continue on this path to let postmodern thinking run our society, we will continue to get further and further away from the very social reforms that we so desperately want to see. And so it is time for a new sexual revolution. The cultural core is begging for it. This time it isn't a call to uninhibited sexual freedom, to endless sexual partners, to this you can't tell me what to do with my life adolescent thought. It's time for a revolution back to biblically based sexuality, the kind that brought freedom from male domination for thousands upon thousands of years, the kind that protects our marriages, the kind that actually allows for racial reconciliation, the kind that made the progress that we saw but has now been put off track. It's time to consider that maybe the guardrails of biblical sexuality are not there to inhibit your freedom, they are there to protect it because right now we are seeing what a departure from that is doing in our culture. I have a daughter and I am worried that if we can't get below the behaviors down into the beliefs, if we can't build a foundation for these movements to stand on, then things will get a little better for a small amount of time and then it will disappear from the media in our minds and it will continue to get worse. As a member of our society, how you believe and how you behave matters. If we want these movements to stick and to spark real change and real reform, we have to understand how we view sex at a core level. We have to understand what we really believe about God and if we're gonna allow our belief to inform our behavior. It's time for Christians to stand by these movements, Me Too and Time's Up. Of course we should stand by them. Our Heavenly Father started them. Jesus spoke the foundation for them into existence. And I'm calling for us to put that foundation to our understanding so that when the winds of postmodern Post-Christian culture come, we can stand firm. Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat on that house, but it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall. The storm is upon us and the house is crumbling because we have removed the foundation and it is time for believers to come out of hiding. It is time for us to take our unique pilgrim's perspective and start being a part of the conversation, start addressing the injustices, quit hiding away and just waiting for our future life with Jesus, but live in a way that brings the will of God down to earth right now. It's time for us to raise our voices in culture. Because if we don't, who will? Let me pray for us. God, we do love you. God, our hearts are broken by the, the stories of the victims. God, countless more who may not have the courage to come forward yet, I pray that this place would be uh, a safe place. God, to love people through hurt, through any kind of systemic injustices, that we would be a people who stand up and stand firm.
God, we, we would speak out for the marginalized. God, that we would be unashamed of preaching your word, your gospel, building our lives on the foundation of your truth and being an example for how others can do the same. We love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So.